Israel has launched airstrikes in Lebanon and the Gaza Strip. They say this is in response to rocket attacks they blame on Hamas. This all follows in the wake of the Israeli police storming of the Al-Aqsa Mosque during Ramadan. That was for the third year in a row. Mohammed Al Kurd is a Palestinian writer who was invited onto BBC News to comment on the situation. The Israeli government, of course, would point to the violence that we've seen from Palestinians as well recently and the salvo of rockets that came across the border today. We know that the Hamas leader um, is in is in Beirut, uh, Ismail Haniyeh, and we know that that couldn't have been done today without the tacit approval of Hezbollah. So the Israelis would say that the Palestinians bear some responsibility for the security situation in Israel as well. You know, that is such a predictable question. I could have I could have written it myself because not only has one of the holiest places been raided twice in a row, not only have 93 Palestinians been killed since the start of the year. Not only has the town of Hawara been subjected to a Jewish pogrom, and even if no Palestinians were killed, millions of us continue to live under a brutal regime of apartheid, under a brutal regime of military occupation. Both internationally recognized there are 2 million Palestinians that live besieged in an open air prison in the Gaza Strip. How much violence is enough violence for people to retaliate? Let me ask you this, Christian. If somebody invaded your home and attacked your family, what would you do? Would you turn the other cheek? That was Mohammed Al Kurd. We've shown you clips of him before. And I mean, he is just so impressive in terms of the, the discipline he has when taking part in these interviews. Because what will always happen, what Israel wants to happen essentially, is for this to be about tit for tat. Oh, they sent a rocket, so we did an airstrike. Then they sent some fireworks, so we raided a mosque. And then the police, the, sorry, not the police, the, the media just invite both people to condemn the actions of something on their side. Will you condemn the Hamas rockets? And then they say to Israel, will you condemn the airstrikes? And then it just seems like this fight where both sides are to blame. It's a cycle of violence. What could you possibly do? And what Mohammed al Kurd is excellent at doing is saying, look, the context here, the context in which this is happening is an illegal occupation. So let's stop talking about who shot what rocket where. The issue here is an illegal occupation. Again, we talked about this on the show before. A good analogy here is, is Ukraine and Russia. We don't see these sort of constant media debates where it's sort of like, well, a Ukrainian, a Ukrainian military tank shot at a Russian um, artillery. Um, so was it kind of the Ukrainians' fault as well as the Russians'? Is this just a cycle of violence which is taking place between the Ukrainian and Russian armies? No, they don't ask that. Quite rightly, because the context here is that the Russians invaded Ukraine. Ukraine is being occupied, right? So, so if Ukraine fights back, we don't say, oh, well, did you provoke Russia to do some further attacks? No, they're defending their country. And uh, the media don't talk about Palestine in the same way, and they should. And I think Mohammed al Kurd is you know, doing great work trying to encourage them to talk about this in a way which is more rooted in reality than ideology. Let's see what happened next in the interview, because the BBC brought in two more voices. One was a British diplomat and the other was a pundit from the Right Wing Heritage Foundation. Peter Ricketts, we've been talking earlier in the programme tonight about, about peace processes in the context of Northern Ireland and, and, and what happened in, in Belfast. When, when you listen uh, to that and you, you hear the anger and, and, and and the recollection of what has happened in the past, it's very difficult to think there can ever be a peace in the Middle East. Well, yes, peace between Israel and Palestinians, certainly. I mean, we've heard about the Abraham Accords, peace between uh, Israel and some of the Arab states. But in that essential conflict, uh, things have got worse over the 40 years that I've been dealing with it rather than better. And now we are again at a very, very high level of tension. Uh, we can see there in that testimony how deep the divide is between the communities trying to live together in some fashion uh, in the state of Israel. And now um, some group or other, Hezbollah or some other extremist group has fired 34 missiles from Lebanon just at this moment of extremely high tension. That's the largest salvo uh, since 2006 when there was very heavy fighting on the northern frontier. So the situation looks very, very tense indeed. But the problem is, Victoria, that the international community will focus on Hezbollah and they'll focus on Hamas and they won't, they, they, they won't focus on, on what we've just heard about the violence towards Palestinians. Well, and I think that's actually very much the point, echoing Lord Ricketts, that, that I mean, the Palestinian Authority did not fire these rockets at Israel. Some combination of Hamas and Hezbollah, both of which are Iranian proxies, decided to escalate this on this historic 
a sort of confluence of Ramadan and Passover and Easter, which has given us you know, very heightened t- tensions. If Iran wanted to be a productive actor, they would ratchet down tensions during this time, not create this dual uh, attack from both the Gaza Strip and Lebanon. And then tonight we have reports that the Houthi want to get in on the act. Let me bring Excuse you in, me. Mohammed. You, you want to respond to that? Yes, I, I, I think uh, I think massive issue with this framing uh, of this as a as some kind of religious conflict, as some kind of like civil war between two communities trying to live with each other. There is a population, millions of people that are under the mercy and under the rule and under a military occupation of the other population. That is that is the, the status quo here. And the escalation does not begin or end with rockets living under occupation day in and day out is an escalation. I am so amazed that despite how far removed you are from the matter, despite the lack, the clear lack of expertise and experience on Palestine, you somehow seem to possess the same level of entitlement that Balfour possessed when he declared Palestine a home for the Zionists, as if it was his to get. Now, again, I thought that was super interesting, that intervention, especially I mean, it it does just sound very colonial, doesn't it? What's going on? Oh, there's the Jews and the Arabs and they have this ancient conflict. And as I say, one side does one action, then the other side fights back, then the other side. It's this cycle of violence between these two very different people. What it completely ignores, there is a military occupation. There is a military occupation of Palestine, which has gone on um, for, depending on your analysis, 50 years or 70 years, right? So whether or not you think that's started in the 70s or started um, in, or the 60s, sorry, or the 40s. Aaron. What's your take here? What can you do? I mean, it's important to say as well, people might be watching, they go, oh, the BBC's coverage of Israel-Palestine is appalling, which it is. But that's no accident. There is a range of, quote-unquote, media advocacy organizations, pro-Israel, Zionist organizations. You know, you say Zionist organization, that's what, it's literally what they call themselves. Um, Honestreporting.com, Media Watch. And if there is a BBC report, which is just accurate, which is literally just accurate, then they will organize petitions, call-ins, they will basically harass these journalists um, into recanting. And as I've said so many times in this show, I, I made a video about it here on the Borough Media, this is what's called the electric fence approach to public relations. Nick Davies talks about it in his book, um, Flat Earth News. And that basically is every time you get journalists even just beginning to touch on the truth of this conflict, a little shock. You raise the costs. They don't do it again. It's very clever from a sort of theoretical public relations point of view, but that's how it operates. So when you see the media time after time after time offering incredibly poor analysis of what's going on in Israel, it's not an accident. Yes, it's partly in curious journalists. Yes, you know, it's partly about a sort of Western quasi-racist view on this thing, an ancient hatred of thousands of years. Well, why do you think that? You read, you read the Bible? The Bible's 2,000 years old, so you think that's what this goes back to? No. The conflict in regards to Israel-Palestine is a century old. It's a century old. It's a very modern conflict. And, and the key tropes and themes of it come out of 19th century European colonialism. Is the exact same project that the original Zionist settlers wanted to perpetuate in that land. We, we, we can you know, talk about that all evening. They themselves said this. Uh, they themselves said that this is a land that needs to be cleared of the indigenous population to make way for settlers. Um, we can't obviously talk about that for several hours as much as perhaps we would like to, because then of course our audience and our listeners and our viewers would be a little bit better informed than if they were watching uh, the BBC on this matter. But like I say, hugely important to say, the electric fence approach, done for a reason, it works. You know, a few years ago, we did a story about that as uh, that, that uh, American Jewish journalist. I think she was at the Associated Press, was it Michael? You know, she she basically lost her job because she didn't have the correct opinions on this thing. So there is a very heavy uh, censorship on this matter, uh, expedited by quote unquote non governmental organisations, quote unquote civil society organisations, uh, and they claim they want factual reporting, but what they want fundamentally is an asymmetric view on things, which only ever criticises Palestinians and only seeks to defend the, the actions of the Israeli state. So you're very rarely going to find proper media coverage and scrutiny of Israel-Palestine. 
And that's partly why. I think it's actually even a bit more subtle than that, because I know I know that's what, you said, that, that's what these groups aim for, right? But the outcome, the reality, isn't that you have a media establishment that's unwilling to criticize Israel, because it's very willing to criticize Israel, but it will also criticize Israel in the same sentence as criticizing the Palestinians. You say, oh, well, Israel have done this bad thing. The Palestinians have done this bad thing. It's all incredibly complex. And then they say this is balance. And you also got this when it came to the Labour debate about the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Because you get, I remember going on um, Politics Live with Jess Phillips and her saying, look, I can criticise the Israeli government without being anti-Semitic. I've just done it right now. And then I, you know, she, I, can't, I can't remember what she talked about, you know, criticise some particular policy. But what she was fundamentally opposed to was talking about apartheid or talking about occupation, because these are structural issues. If, you, if you're talking about how the structural situation is fundamentally one of occupation and one of dispossession, that's what you're not allowed to say. What you're allowed to say is, oh, the, the Israelis should act with a bit more restraint. Oh, the Israelis should um, be a bit more careful not to bomb civilians. But what you're not allowed to talk about is the fundamental context, because that's what's challenging. And so long as we're talking about, well, he fired this rocket, they did this airstrike, that works in Israel's favor, because essentially that works in favor of the status quo. What you're saying there is, this is too complicated. There are people on both sides, difficult issues. Meh, let's just, let's just leave it. You know, you're probably not going to resolve this one with these ancient hatreds. But that's essentially what's going on here, right? And I think Mohammed El-Kurd, as I say, called it out impeccably. Mm -hmm.